Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to mute Christy. Christy, mute yourself. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. We're going to talk about the burning of Notre Dame, and we're going to talk about WikiLeaks tonight. And uh, this is episode, I think this is 350, 350 or 351. Uh, long on information, short on professionalism. And as always, we'll be right back. All right. Welcome back to We Are Libertarians. If it's your first time joining us, we welcome you uh, as well. Uh, for those of you who are new, we chit chat for just a few minutes and then we get started on the information. Um, my name is Chris Spangle. I am the host of We Are Libertarians. Sitting over there is my co-host, Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good. Going good. All right, uh, Harry. And I'm going to stop this because we have a very special guest. One of my favorite people, one of the smartest people I know, it is Sarah Brady Wagner. Sarah, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. You have you you dyed your hair for We Are Libertarians. You knew this was going to be on video, so yes, thank you uniquely for, for you. I yes, thank you for doing. Don't that. have purple hair any other time. Yes, thank you for making the effort to make it that purple. Um, here on We Are Libertarians, uh, you, you this is not being streamed live like normal, but you can go check out the recorded Zoom video on our YouTube channel. Please go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, you know, Sarah, you have uh, been doing these daily episodes with Hody and uh, Hody Johns, Dennis, oh, excuse me, Reinhold. <laughs> I always, what what is it called? Doxing? Dox, yes, dox. I always accidentally dox uh, Reinhold. He needs to I need to you're, pick you're clarifying it really well. I know. I'm not really drawing <laughs> I'm not drawing attention. Yeah, I'm not drawing attention to the fact that Dennis is Reinhold. But whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Who? And Paul, Paul is Reinhold. <laughs> Paul Copeland and Dale. And the dailies are have been fantastic, Sarah. Um you I, I do you want to talk about your new opportunity and what you're up to now. Can you? Um, yeah, I can. I can. As long as we clarify, though, that this is not part of my my new exciting job. This, this is, is not an interview. I am not interviewing Sarah. She's one yes, of the no. co-hosts here on the network, and this is totally separate. And we do not. She does not endorse. Nor any do opinions do not reflect my employer. Um, of <laughs> especially if they're coming from me. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I've had a wonderful opportunity um, to work within the Greater Liberty Movement um, with an organization called Grassroots Liberty or Grass Sorry Grassroots Leadership Academy. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's really kind of varied, but essentially, I get to travel around the country um, teaching people how to be more effective activists, more effective just community organizers. You know, people who want to help make other people's lives better, but don't really know how to go about starting to do that cool so. so so it's like what's your daily like what are you doing on the daily basis um well it depends on if i'm on the road or not if i'm on the road then there's already you know a group of people who um a field director in the area has identified they need hey this is a skill set they need sometimes it's like just basic overview of like um you know different activism mobilization techniques uh, sometimes it's really specific i'm actually getting to do a lot more with um criminal justice reform now Mm. Um, which is kind of my passion point. Yeah, for sure. Um, so sometimes it's going in and talking about like, what is the current state of your state's criminal justice system? You know, it really varies. So education is a great place to start in order to get people to a point where they can do something effective. I don't know. I find a lot of people are very um, enthusiastic and don't have much of a direction for that enthusiasm. So now I, I've got a job teaching people that. Yeah, I noticed that at the Libertarian Party of Indiana. I mean, I was basically chief trainer, chief fundraiser, chief everything. But what I noticed about people want, that wanted to get involved in libertarian stuff of any variety, be it a county party, a candidacy, I, I noticed there were two central problems. They didn't think they knew enough about libertarianism to represent it, and they didn't want to disappoint other libertarians in the way that they represent it. And two was they didn't, 
think that they knew how to do politics or organizing of any type. And so they just didn't do any of it. <laughs> so that's, it's very necessary what you're doing. I mean, what are you, what are you kind of finding as you go out and talk to people? I mean, are you, are you talking to students? Are you talking to like, you know, well, boomers? Like what, what's the, what, who are you talking to when you're doing these trainings? Uh, the cool thing is that like by the timing of when I've been hired, they're kind of trying to shift that, uh, you know, their target for who they're working with uh, and really make it more broad and focus on like, coalitions over issues. So, you know, the idea being that within the greater liberty movement, there are a lot of things that um, are people's individual passion points. Like you have criminal justice reform. Sometimes even within that, you've got people who are really, I'm passionate about voting rights. You've got other people who are really passionate about like bail reform. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to shift more towards working with groups that we can agree on this particular issue. And we're not going to focus so much on if we are, you know, that 80%, 90% total value, you know, consistent. We're like, because this is the thing we're going to work on together. So right. um, I, because I think because they like the purple hair, I get sent out for more uh, like college groups. Um, but there are a fair amount of just like older, more conservative, you know, audiences and they have different things they're more interested in though. So you mm -hmm. kind of work with them on where they're at. Are you saying the Tea Party's still kicking? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was in Arkansas recently. Yes. Really? So what's going on in the Tea Party movement? Um, I mean, a lot of the same inertia, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Infighting, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what happened here. We all do that, right? Right, yeah. It's called the Libertarian Party. I've been a, I've been a part of it for a while. It's called politics. Yeah, the human condition. Let's upgrade it to all humanity. There you go. <laughs> so... You yeah, know, anybody who's dealt with the Republicans or the Democrats is like, let's not pretend it's better. It's so, bigger. But yeah, that's fair. That's fair. As you're going out and doing these trainings, are there like a few things that you just find yourself consistently saying over and over and over? Um, well, the nice thing is uh, it's I haven't been doing it for too terribly long, so it hasn't gotten really repetitive yet. I've actually only been on the job for not even three months at this point. Right. Um, so a lot of um, a, a lot of when you're talking to like newer activists, like just, you know, where they're at that enthusiasm level, um, it is like just the nuts and bolts of like, okay, so if you were to run for office, do you know what, what offices there are in your area? Like what's the structure of, do you live in a town? You live right. just out in the County? Like if you live in a town that doubles the amount of seats that you could find and, you know, but also um, talking to people about maybe government is not the best, um, the best kind of like angle for you to go particularly working with like libertarian party libertarians we're a very eccentric bunch um <laughs> sometimes yeah. sometimes we're really like politics is not where you're the most effective you might be way more effective like actually putting together um you know a nonprofit group in your community to i actually because i had a I had an uber driver who was telling me about her community in pennsylvania who they put together a nonprofit to take over the town park <laughs> Well, that's cool <laughs> because they weren't taking care of it right. and there were some people who both who people who lived in the community and people who like had grown up and then moved away who were like hey i've got money let me donate you know this is an important part of my childhood i want that to be sustained and the town's not doing it because the town doesn't have the tax base even so right. they're like let us just we're gonna take that away from you we're gonna take it off your table hmm. she was telling me she's like it was a really unique approach she's like we should have more of that, though. <laughs> it shouldn't be the unique approach. It should be exactly. the, the common sense approach. Yeah, that's really interesting. So did they succeed in taking it away? They did. Yeah. So they for a couple of years now, they uh, have had this, their town park um, has actually been run by an independent nonprofit. Ooh. So how difficult was it to, to take it over? Well, the nice thing is, is when you can come at working both with and outside of government non-adversarially and like acknowledge, hey, we all live here we actually have common interest, there's mutual benefit, then you can work with the town. And then the paperwork gets a lot easier if you've got people who actually want to make sure that's the outcome. Wait a minute. Are you saying that I shouldn't be confrontational to my local politicians? Yes. In fact, I'm saying you should probably make friends with them. <laughs> All right. See, something doesn't compute because that's the exact opposite of what I think I ought to do as a libertarian Oh, and that, that I see on Facebook. So can you please clarify what I ought to do? Well, I, why don't you think about the results that you also see from those tactics? No one talks to me. I have no friends. <laughs> I've been removed from every city council meeting for years. Well, 
maybe starting with why you're being removed and, and going from there is a learning experience. I the mean, smell of my feet. <laughs> Keeping your shoes on, good yeah. start. All right, okay. So they, as long as they don't have to put up a sign specifically because of your behavior, <laughs> then that's a good starting place. Do not feed the Spangle really made me angry, to be honest, because I was getting free cupcakes. Uh, no, I think that goes back to the, the daily episode that I did with our friend Jason, Jason Doolittle uh, there in Texas as he lobbied to get chickens in his backyard and succeeded by just going out to coffee with his local representative. Yeah. I mean, it, it is easy if you if you really are interested in kind of what she's talking about, then go back to that episode um, and listen to kind of how he did it because we laid it out over 20 minutes. And you, I think, Sarah, I think people would be so surprised at how easy it is on a town level to really make big changes just mm -hmm. by showing up regularly. Oh, even more than that, like if you want to actually run for your town, depending on the size of your town, you would be amazed how few votes that's going to take. Like, yeah. um or, or sometimes it won't take votes at all. Again, if you can start from a let's make friends level, like in our town, we have four commissioners. Um, my husband plans to at some point in the not too distant future run for one of those seats. So he can either figure out that it's only gonna take like 450 votes to win anyways. So if you're going to campaign well, like that's doable or right. the easier option, you could go and make friends with the like, 70 plus year old guy who's currently in that office and try, you know, let him know, Hey, you know, this is something I really am interested in, you know, being involved in, in town government. And you might be surprised. He's like, actually, why don't, why don't you go ahead and run and I'll just step down next year. <laughs> you know, I'm and tired. Run on the post. I've had yeah, enough. You'd be amazed, especially go and find out what the average age of your elected town. Of are you, Right. The amount people, of excitement in the eyes <laughs> when young people walk in, they're like, don't scare them off. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's that way at churches. Like I was at an experience recently at my church with a bunch of like people that my age from our small group and like they stopped the class at the end and they go, how do we get more of people your age there? How do we get you to, I go, well, as the official spokesperson for all millennials, I mean, Millennials are such a hot commodity right now. It's not like the boomers who are on the downslide, Harry. Mimosas. Mimosas? I probably would go more to early. It goes early. a long way. Yeah. If they had like a nice mimosa or a Bloody Mary bar for early service at church, <laughs> I would probably be at the 8 a.m. one. Yeah. The times in my life that I have actually gone to church on a regular basis, uh, the churches usually have really nice coffee bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I'm gonna come, but I'm I'm gonna get myself a mocha. <laughs> you can get some nice Jack's donuts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fifty cents or longs. Uh, well, Jack's it's a Jack's church. Is it a Jack's church? It's closest to a Jack's donut there in Center Grove, and that's why it's going down. Because yeah, longs is right down the street. Did you know there's a longs? Oh, I get well, stuck in the longs traffic when I go to church on Sunday. Yes. Remember to donate to the donut ministry, or or do you just <laughs> no. take the donuts? I avoid the donuts because I'm already morbidly obese, trying to work my way to obese. <laughs> I've seen pictures; you've gotten much better. Yeah, I was fatally obese at one point. Yeah, that I I forget how fat I was. You don't like I never really found a good before picture and I was on my Facebook memories. I kind of had one that where I'm like with Rupert and I'm in a tie dye t-shirt and I just look like, <laughs> you know, that meme with the, with the lizard where it's like, <laughs> uh, yeah. that's kind of what I look like in that photo. But then I found one of me speaking at a Marion County convention in 2009, 2000. No, I think it was like 10 or 11, maybe 10. And I'm, I'm full 320, 330. I am enormous. Like, my head looks like when Beetlejuice's head shrinks. Like, and then just my big body. And I, I sent it to Rupert, and Rupert just replied, I know I remember when your arms didn't go down straight. <laughs> that is the meanest thing I've ever heard Rupert Bonham say in his life. <laughs> He's also just kind of like, you're like, you're, you're, not, you're not incorrect. He's not incorrect at all. I mean, you're, my side titties, like, kind of made my arms flail out to the side like a, like a pretty dress. Um but if you can go check it out on my Instagram at C Spangle, and you can see this picture of me, and I'm just the inspiration. I'm, ooh, yeah, like, the inspiration. I'm, I'm like 265 right now, and that, you know, you go, man, I'm just so chubby. And then I look at that, and I'm like, all right, I'm good. Let's eat. Let's eat these pectin-based Russell Stover uh, Easter egg. What are what are those called? Jelly beans. 
Oh, good. Yeah. You yeah. shouldn't eat those. Uh, I shouldn't. I don't think Chris Fit, Fit would impre- uh, appreciate you eating those jelly beans. Here's, let me tell you about my day. Okay. I woke up uh-huh. at 6 a.m. I, wa- I moseyed on over here, drank mm-hmm. some water, had an English muffin that got my fat ass to the gym nice. at 7.15 this morning. So uh, I'm, I'm out of time. Like somebody has said, hey, do you want to hang out? And I said, the next moment I have free is two hours on April 25th. Uh, it's April 16th. I, get, I go, I just, I'm booked every minute. And so I'm like, the only time I'm ever going to get to work out is if I have become one of those morning workout people, which I hate those people. Yeah. But the gym was so much cleaner. It was so much more empty. Is it nice? I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't as tired. I mean, I don't know if you're a gym more, a morning person, a morning person no, in general, Sarah. I'm just thinking, I'm, you're saying like the clean aspect. I'm thinking of um, when I was a nanny, all the times yeah. when you take the kids out to like play areas, when you go and you're like the first people there and all yeah. the toys are still put away and sorted and like not just half of the pieces thrown on the other side of the room. <laughs> mm. That's sort of what the gym, the LA fitness by me is like, it's just, you go at 8 PM and it's just like toddlers were in there playing with their blocks <laughs> all day. And that's basically emotional toddlers. Let's be honest, but much. yeah, but I, you know, and then I got to work and then I worked hard and then I went to therapy mm-hmm. and that took me an hour and a half to get from Carmel to here uh, with a Chick-fil-A stop on the way. Um, that I'll tell you what broad ripples, Lemonade, not as good as Southport. You got to stick with Southport Chick-fil-A, Harry. Um, <clears throat> we comparing Chick-fil-A's go, now. You should go to... Uh, this is a hyper-local section. Fitz, Fitzgerald's Lunch House on the um, east side of Lawrence. They have the better sweet tea. See, I get the lemonade. See, they got great sweet tea there because they give you um, <laughs> the correct re- way to sweeten your tea. Um, simple syrup and not just powdered sugar. Or sweet it before. Sarah's this way right. You can adjust this, is, this is a hyper local, like, Sarah's current right. place this is the moment we're having. 15 people, but I'm just telling everybody about my day because I want someone to care. Uh, the, oh. Yeah. The, <laughs> um, at my office, we have a gym in the basement. Uh huh. So it's great, which I got the Wi Fi working down there. So I like to go down there on the treadmill, do meetings. Um, I did uh, my one on one with my boss while I was uh, doing squats. <laughs> really? Yeah. He asked me to turn the camera off. <laughs> Were you making grunt faces at your bar? <laughs> well, before I had it set up to make sure I was taping myself to like make sure my form was. So yeah, I just started yeah. the meeting at the same height level and just left it there and started to squat in front of the camera. Sarah's left. Uh, if you, <laughs> I don't think I did can we? pin her video. She walked away. For those of you wondering, yes, I have failed keto. I did keto. I lost like, I lost like seven pounds in two weeks. And I was miserable every single second of it. I hated every minute of it. And then I got food poisoning. Mm. And from the stacked pickle, which mm-hmm. I now call the attacked pickle. Mm-hmm. Clever. And, Clever. It, Clever and, and I had to go on the brat diet. You know, bread, rice, applesauce, and toast. The heck is that? No, bananas. Bananas. Uh, and it was just all downhill from there. So, uh, But I got down to a slim 260 thanks to throwing up. Nice. So nice. I, was, I was very the best hot. way. I was very hot that week, Sarah. <laughs> I love the throw up six pack that you get. Yeah. Well, I'd have to throw up. Oh, I don't know. Every day for the rest of my life, probably to get to a six pack. But um, goals. Yeah, not gonna have a six pack. I don't think, Sarah. I'm just not. It's not in the cards for a spangle. I, I think you can. Trade offs. <laughs> right. It's but, really hard to get the six pack, but it's worth it. Okay, it's not worth it. It's not worth it, it's no. Worth it. If you I've had to go it. through what I had to go, the, the torture of keto was just too much. I'll uh, just eat less carbs, but I can't do that. Keto's not torture? It's torture. It's it was absolute hell. Um, it's a beautiful. Uh, once you get to push past, get to the max board, and you, you know, get into ketosis, you just feel amazing and that you can just do anything. You keep I saying that. Not- I, yeah, I don't know. Sarah, have you ever tried keto or anything like that? Uh, no, because I have too many friends who are um, – well versed in like basic biology and will tell me right. all about the terrible terrible things that it will do to your body yeah and then you I believe, st- it, I believe it destroys your colon long term so hmm. um wow. keto colostomy bags can be a thing well yeah, harry see comment. how much time i save by not having to use the bathroom harry that's an hour i get back every day that harry carry, it. here to comment on your colon <laughs> please give there us a call that's, that's an hour that you were spending in the bathroom that you can now spend at crossfit exactly how okay. would i find my memes then 
<laughs> All right. I, I use an intern. An intern? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah the process my my, my, my my dank means. <laughs> All right. Let's get into it. Uh, we were going to talk about the 2020 field, and uh, I just felt like, you know, WikiLeaks and Notre Dame is a little bit more of a hot topic. And I, you know, the, the, the 2020 field, trust me, they're going to be there forever. Uh, we've got our first debate coming up here, I think within the month. Sarah, do you know when the first debate is? I think it's like in two weeks, maybe. Something very short. Sarah has gone away. She has left us. <laughs> Sarah, do you know when the first debate is? Oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah, I think first, it's like, the first Democratic debate even. Yeah, I think it's in like the next month. I swear. I'm not so, kidding. I'm really just hoping that some of them drop off before then because the, you can't just keep adding. Oh, just, they'll try. They'll try. You can't fit them all on stage. Um, so, you know, I was watching the, the burning of Notre Dame. I don't, you know, here in Indiana, we see Notre Dame because we have the college here. Okay, and, American. Yeah, there were a lot of um, this tasteful burning of touchdown Jesus memes floating around, but uh, <laughs> Tad shouldn't have made those. <laughs> um, but I was watching it burn, and I, I had twinges of 9-11 as I watched. I don't know if you, you were able to see it, Harry or Sarah, but I, I, I work on social media, so I saw it pretty much immediately and saw the Twitter videos and... Like, I just thought it was a meme at first. Like, I'm at the point now where I don't believe anything that I see anymore online. And so mm -hmm. I saw the flames and I just thought somebody was making some sort of meme. And then it kept going. It went bing, 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 bing. And you go, oh, this is real. And so you go, oh, just a fire at, at Notre Dame is what I'll call it. Yeah. Uh, and you go, well, it's probably just like, you know. A, a room or something mm -hmm. yeah and then like within 30 minutes the spire is collapsing and you're going you're like i'm gonna cry this is horrible uh and so i just was thinking about it because we're going to talk about wikileaks today we're going to talk uh, a little bit get into some of that kind of describe wikileaks but i think juxtaposed to notre dame i, I want to start with sarah and ask her this because we start we started to get into the conversation on messenger and then she's like just save this for the air let's not waste our time with this now which is why I like Sarah. She's very efficient. Um, why was I so sad? And why do you think people were so affected by watching this cathedral in Paris, France burn down that was built 850 years ago? So I, I, was, I was actually talking this through with, with my husband to kind of get an idea of what exactly I wanted to say. Because you, you're right. You're really distraught. And like there were a lot of people who were really, really distraught. And I think... Um, I mean, in a, in a really big, like, you know, metaphysical sense is if lack of a better way to say so. It's, it's kind of having to grapple with the impermanence of existence in general. Um, particularly, I noticed that the people who reacted the most strongly, uh, aside from those who were associating it like with Catholic or religious purposes, were, were people who tend to dedicate their life to trying to build something that will have a legacy that you'll be able to leave behind. And I mean, literally watching Notre Dame burn is, is just this huge moment of realization for most people. Who, if you try not to think about the fact that you can try and build something that may seem to last forever and it may be destroyed at any moment. And that's just how reality is. Well, there are just some things that are just always supposed to be there. But they're not. Right. There's nothing that's ever supposed to be there forever. And that's... Like, I think that is the thing that you're faced with that causes that huge amount of emotion to come up when you're watching it burn. Like you're saying, you have this huge set idea that it's, it's supposed to be there forever, but it's not. It's just made of wood. It can catch on fire in a roofing accident. Roofing accidents happen all the time. Was it really a roofing accident, Sarah? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's really statistically likely. Roofing accidents happen all the time. I mean, Are you sure that it wasn't Muslims or yellow vests yeah. or the globalists? Yeah, nope, in. not sure at all. I'm, I'm sure there are great uh, theories and lines that can be drawn together. In fact, it sounded like you maybe had one or two to throw out at us. No, I have no theories. I think it was a roofing accident. I just am so tired of living, and maybe it's our feeds, Harry laser beams <laughs> okay pointed at the roof <laughs> right okay. caught it on fire there was actually then, a story that got shared a lot from like three years ago about um, churches about what, cathedrals burning 
Oh, um, no, about um, it was something in a, about a um, gas tanks being found near Notre Dame. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I saw that like a car and yeah, lawns and yeah. I, that was concerning just because people were so enthusiastic about trying to grasp at some sort of like oh it's got to be you know related to some sort of terrorism there has to be it's it there has to be somebody to blame is essentially what it is what i Um, said when they started banning alex jones is you whenever you prohibit something you make it more attractive and you really saw right before the election with the arrest of that guy who had the van and was like writing was sending bombs or whatever to cnn and I had never seen more false, the words false flag more in my life. And I think with the, just something as simple as this that seems fairly cut straightforward, where there have been articles about, I saw one today from a couple years ago saying Notre Dame's in danger. We need to renovate it. We need to do this. You know, you're doing construction. Anybody who's worked on a construction site like I did for 10 years, you know, the massive heaters that you've got or, you know, people who are using, if, if you're, using heat guns or just the amount of things that can go wrong with electrical and gang boxes. It's perfectly within the realm of possibility. And most likely that it just is exactly what it was. And it was a construction accident. And yet here we are with more people than ever in my lifetime going, there's more to this than you think. And I go, no, there's not. There's really, like, at what point, I'm just exhausted by the conspiracy mongers amongst us all. Like, sometimes it's very clear that something's off, you know, like the 2013 sarin gas in in Syria. But then Mm -hmm. other times you're just like, well, I think there's there's two parts to it. One is it's it's reinforced by every time, you know, you do have some sort of, sometimes conspiracy theories are absolutely founded in truth and, you know, turn out to be that way. And we all find out. But in a lot of cases, there are people who, um, for, for one reason or another, you have a difficulty accepting that bad things happen or that things happen that don't have anyone to blame. You know, that, that is just kind of the nature of, of reality and of, of chaos in general. It's like there are going to be things that, that happen that right. you're like, wow, that was a really crazy coincidence even. Um, but accepting that requires being comfortable with a certain degree of uncertainty that a lot of people don't like. Yeah, and if you're not do, comfortable with uncertainty, you have to always be seeking, well, I found the answer. People don't like chaos. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, that's why like everyone, a lot of people started going and going after like conspiracy for 9-11 because a lot of people who saw that, it was like their biggest first thing act of terrorism that they've ever seen or anything like right. this, especially on American soil. So, and it broke up the pattern of the normalcy. Mm-hmm. So they went to like, okay, this has to be planned because if that doesn't, then my whole life can be messed up at a moment's notice by someone else I do not know from a land I n- never heard of. Yeah, yeah, because it can. Correct. So it's so just just the same way with this. Like when if this does turn out to be just uh, you know an accident, like it's probably is going to be. It's you know a lot of people are still going to probably look at conspiracy theories for the next five years yeah but you two you two both know that if it was the muslims the government there ain't never gonna tell us conspiracy theories also come from a place of incredible comfort and security Mm -hmm. i mean if you you seek out i always you know one joke that always is made is anybody who really believes in conspiracy theories has never tried to run a group project (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah you know the, the idea that you can keep thousands and thousands of people from ever leaking one tiny little bit of information it is laughable to me in a lot mm-hmm. of cases. We're we're 20 um, years out. We're 20 years out from 9/11 almost. Mm-hmm. And you go, "All right, so let's let's take the buildings for instance." And you put the thermite in the buildings. Mm-hmm. You've got people working late. You've got the security services that implant it. You've got the security services that guard the buildings. You've got the custodians. You've got the the taxi drivers that drive like you just go, "All right, so low end a thousand people probably at least, in, in yeah. a building that size and n- like no eyewitnesses they did such a good job killing a thousand people and when none of us ever noticed and they did their nda was so ironclad and there's no missing money that paid all these people off like i don't know you just go i i mean i was watching world they i was watching the coverage when tr- wtc7 went down and they're like it's unsafe it's going to fall on the workers we're going to take it down but it's not in the report. It's like, okay, well, just go find, like, NBC from 2011. 
you yeah. know, it also comes from, from a lot of people from a place where they're like, they see all these big, terrible things. You know, you see right. 9-11, you see, you know, all of the things that the news mm -hmm. focuses on, but they haven't actually really experienced much mm -hmm. of, of that reality of like the terrible things that can happen to you in just normal life. Uh, people, in my experience, at least people who've had at least one or two really terrible, awful things happen to them for no good reason and have had to like deal with that and recover are much more comfortable with the idea that like terrible things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, break it down to you guys. All right. <laughs> so the way you can get all these other departments, right. To act independently, but still working for goal is you got to compartmentalize them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. you've got small groups all working to a bigger group, but they don't know the whole big picture. Okay, so you've got to have these small groups all the So it was this small group of taxi drivers that was compartmentalized <laughs> with the small group of people who you only gave them the thermite a on piece the of the puzzle. Right, right. See, you trick the painters to paint the, the frame with the thermite. They don't know that it's thermite. It's just paint, right? So Ooh. you compartmentalize that. Yes, Harry Jones. People, yeah. <laughs> Harry Jones is my new favorite character. We're going to do this more. I like this. Yeah, see, here's what I always think is funny, though, is that conspiracy theorists never think that there's even one conspiracy theorist who was involved right. in your big conspiracy. Like, you didn't think there was one guy who was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you want me to do this? I, I, I need the backstory here. And like, yeah. Well, somebody accused me, and, and people don't want to talk about this stuff because, like, um... The gymnast that, that broke her two ankles. Nothing has pissed me off in the last week more, uh, more than that. Like, yeah. as a social media, like, I am a web director by trade. That is my day job. And if my boss judged me on clicks, I think that incentivizes you to act unethically. And so you have all these social media directors for all these news outlets who are going, well, what's going to get me the most clicks? People are definitely going to watch this painfotainment moment where this cute girl gets her legs broken in a gruesome accident. Who's not going to look like, who's not going to want to click on that. And then like less than a week later, you've got the same web directors posting the article of her condemnation of their posting it. And they don't even like, I just can't sit. I can't imagine being the person who works at like my local THR mm -hmm. at the local NBC affiliate going, you're like, you don't yeah. even see this, do you? Yeah, like, I want to go dude or lady dude. Like, do you not understand how unethical it was to post it in the first place and then how stupid you look posting the follow-up, you know? And I was just trolling. I, I know it didn't make any difference, but I just think... And, and then you look at, like, all these mini news stories, like uh, stepdad molest daughter gives her abortion at, with a coat hanger, and you just go... At what point do we start looking at the news and going, none of this has any value whatsoever? You know, what, what does this really, how does this impact me? Um, I have no idea where, where I was going with this. I just got into a total rant on this because it just is driving me. It, it just makes me so mad. I think we need to be Tangents really good. are okay. Yeah, we just need to be good consumers of our media. Harry's like, uh, Sarah, Harry uh, Harry, uh, Sarah, you're new here. If we let him tangent, we'll be here till. 11. No, no, no. You just have to be skilled enough at bringing it back around. So, any yeah. Notre Dame. But yeah, does, and does she just like low hand like hit me? Uh, so I'm not skilled. Ouch. No, 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 no. I'm gonna go <laughs> You're gonna be fine. Um, but uh, I wish I remember. Uh, it, I had a I had a cogent point, but but I just got blinded by my rage for unethical web director behavior. Um, right. Whereas I think this clearly, the burning of Notre Dame, does it really affect me in my daily life? No. But there is some aspect to the story that I think clearly touches all of us to the point that Notre Dame here in Indiana is giving $100,000. Apple has pledged money. You have 400 billion euros already pledged by French billionaires saying, we're going to help rebuild this. Like, well, yeah, it's... You know, I mean, it's just like any other worldwide tragedy where everybody goes here. Let me show that I care. Yeah. And so there's very few buildings like Notre Dame, maybe Westminster Abbey or Parliament in Britain, the Taj Mahal, uh, maybe Tiananmen Square and, the, and Red Square Lucas in China. Lucas Oil Stadium. Lucas Oil Stadium, yes. Um, the, uh, the, uh, where the, the Kremlin. Where the, the Kremlin. That, that might be a good one. I mean, I can't think of a lot of buildings um barcelona i, mean, I feel like we just named we could probably make a list of at least a dozen 
There, there's, those are just buildings. I mean, Talladega, the pyramids. There's, there's only a few, I would say a dozen buildings in human existence that kind of are in the same league as, as Notre Dame. It's and like they're the, all vulnerable to destruction. Yeah, they yeah. have 13th Accept century it. wood, right. Can you imagine if the White House would have burned with like computers, like when yeah. the British would have burned right. oh. on Instagram? Woo, it's your White House. Yeah. Oh, man. British were b- burning the, the Capitol building, the White House. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, I mean, the memes at 9 11, it took probably 14, 15 years for people to actually be able to post 9 11 memes. Mm-hmm. This was like immediate. Yeah, that was, yeah, immediate. Like, within well, five minutes, Tad had already... Because there were said, no people. Nobody died. I, I think that's a great point, yeah. There was no, there was no human tragedy to it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Listen, but, there was nobody that everybody had to say, oh, no, that's that's too soon. No, it's it's too soon for what? To Again, it, I think it just kind of comes down to there's people who immediately laugh because they're like, yep, shit's impermanent. And well, there's so, who are like, but it, we lost this great thing. All right. So I've been arguing with Boss Hogg, who is a cold, heartless son of a bitch. Which was built with slave labor. What was? The, the uh, cathedral. The cathedral, right. Yeah. Um, so was Wall. What's your point? <laughs> um, <laughs> Sarah, so Boss Hogg and I have been arguing about this because he's like, nobody died. That's what matters. Human life is what matters. And my argument to him was, there's like a billion people in the world. They're replaceable, and they only last 60 years anyways. This is a, this is a structure that just stands the test of time. It's 850 years old. It's hard to re- rebuild. The Do you think you could rebuild it in digital? I, but I don't know. Digital is reality. Yeah. Well, so, you could create but, a simulation of it, and if you could have a decent enough augmented reality, how would that be functionally different from the regular thing? I've had enough of... I, I'm with I, Sarah. It's it's called craftsmanship. Look it up, Sarah. We can three D. You think that. that creating that three D environment doesn't involve any craftsmanship? Not not like not like carving. What a high five! Right not now. like so carving a beautiful wood spire spire one hundred and fifty years ago. So here's my point. Here's the argument that he and I have been having. He's it's like people. Skill. People are massively overestimating like they're just this is overblown everybody's just virtue signaling that they care about this building and it's an excuse to show their picture of the stained windows in 2004 when they visited it nobody died it doesn't matter and and i argue that that's good that nobody died but there is a significance to a building like this because it brings the past to a very real presence that's my argument against something like a virtual reality is that you can't, it's not the same experience to put on Oculus goggles and virtually walk through a cathedral. It, it takes in every one of your senses and exposes you to a, a point I, in time. I'm sorry. I was just thinking, I was like, well, just because just we haven't gotten the technology up to the point where it's completely immersive for all of your senses. I'm sure we'll get there at some point. Yeah. Is the smell... You're being a Feel real Sarah. Level. Sarah, you're being a real Harry right now. Uh, <laughs> Harry always loves to thwart, team. Harry yeah, always team. loves to thwart my points, but the the reality is that the, the a building like this speaks to us in a way that very few pieces of art do, and and it does have some importance. And Boss Hogg's like it has no importance. I sell rebar for a living. I build roads. It's the same thing. It can be rebuilt. I'm like, I think the only importance is cultural, and that's just what you make of it. Okay, explain that. I mean, it's so to, the idea is that it has different meaning to you than it does to somebody else. To somebody who didn't grow up immersed in Western culture and told that this is the most beautiful architecture of all time and it has stood the test of time, they're like, okay, that's really sad that your old building burned. <laughs> Give me an example of somebody who thinks that. I'm prob- I'm actually thinking somebody who grew up in the uh, Middle East or in the Eastern um, part of the world who has learned much more about um, relics in that area than we have, for example. Sure. I mean, there is still this really weird divide of like, there's really amazing old stuff across the world, not just focused in Europe. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yep. So for some people, yes, that's a tragic loss. For other people, it's not my culture. It doesn't actually have any significance to me. So there was nothing lost. All right. But the, to those of us who live in Western culture. Because you're more what, important. No, I'm not saying it's more important. 
you're being a real SJW now. <laughs> no, I think Sorry, that, it's all that hair dye. I know. All the hair dye came into your brain. No, I think, but Western culture is important to, and I'm not going to say Western civilization because I'm not going uh, full uh, tiki torch here. I mean, there, there is a message from the past to the present in a building like this. Is there not? I mean, do you, do, you just, do you just, but do you not, like, did you feel nothing yesterday watching that building burn? Like, do you just not care? Not really? Is that what you're no. trying to say? All right, I why not? I, I really don't. I mean, I, yeah, I think it's sad, but I think of it as now, to me, it, and I think this is actually, I've discussed this with, like, various members of my family before. It's kind of how I just deal with a big, significant, like, horrible thing that's happened. It's like, okay, that's happened now. Now we live in a world where Notre Dame is not the same, and now it is, we live in a world where Notre Dame was burnt down in 2019, and we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll rebuild it, but, like, I'm thinking back to, like, the library at Alexandria burning was a huge loss, I, but it was a loss because, like, we lost things that we didn't have the ability to replicate. We didn't lose anything here. We didn't have the ability to replicate. Point. We, we lost the original of something, and that absolutely is tragic, but... Like, has anybody bothered looking into how much of that was all original to begin with? How much of it has been repaired? I mean, this kind of goes back to the whole, like, if you've replaced all the parts in a ship, is it still the same ship? Mm -hmm. So no, if you the, uh... rebuild Notre Dame the same, is it the same? Yeah, I mean, we saved the windows. Sure. <laughs> Foundation's still there. I'm just, I'm letting, I'm letting you guys talk. Keep going. I'm sure, the VA well, no, I mean, if... the basements are fine. If, and especially if, you know, you were talking about the importance of that skill set of that craftsmanship, if we haven't lost that craftsmanship yet, if those um, particular techniques aren't yet lost to time, they may still be completely replicable. But are they? <laughs> because well, that's, I mean, I, that's I something I that I think we'll have to find out. It'll be, right. if anything, that may be the project of, of a generation of archaeologists and of restoration artists. Let's just 3D we print the whole building. What well, these original, we may be able to do that. They may be the solution. Well, that's the thing. Like a lot of the things that they did to make the arch, what they did with the equipment that they had, you would have to do it a certain way, which we don't have to because we got steel, we can and aluminum, Harry, aluminium, and then we can is it, really is, just hold on, hold on, Sarah. And then Harry, put, Harry wants to put steel steel siding on the top of the Notre Dame. No, but maybe steel, um, steel, steel uh, structures. Yeah. Maybe have Yep. This is aluminium frame. This is the worst idea you've had since trying to move to I since say, trying to build a wall in my apartment. I got a better idea. Okay, so wait, what is the what is the inherent good of wood only because it was used in the first place? Why it just burned? Why would you want to put that back? So you guys exactly. have moved from we should replicate it as it is to let's make it a better. A, no, we're saying we could replicate it as it is, and now we've moved to if, if we could replicate it, then we haven't had this huge tragedy because there's been nothing permanently lost. Now that we've acknowledged we can move past that emotionally and should we, now there's the discussion of if we're going to, uh, you know, if we're going to restore it, that doesn't necessarily mean replicating it exactly. Sometimes okay. it means making it so that it will have a better ability to withstand the test of time. Well, yeah. a frame-off restoration, if you would. Um, what if we made some sort of dome structure? What? That could open up on nice days. You, what if we made it with a nylon roof, just like the Hoosier Dome back in the day? No, there, this this building okay, took so this building what took. If we, what if they accept that? Okay, it's burned, and now we can move forward and go. Well, this is still Notre Dame. We still have great, amazing, world important events that happen here. I'm right with Harry on this one. Like, maybe what can we do to? Now that it's rebuilt, the, the 2019 renovation that, well, ended up being a lot bigger than we expected, you know, where they added the, you know, I call it, you know, the angel dome that yeah. the Pope gives his now annual speech underneath. And that's something that is now part of humanity and is part of our culture and tradition that wouldn't have been there otherwise. We should have done the 2020 candidates. The <laughs> Apple <laughs> Notre Dame. Uh, okay, not, I'm so annoyed with both of you. <laughs> the Catholic Church does not need sponsorship. Oh, it'd be great. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> you, you, the have now, you have now <laughs> taken a holy space a sacred cathedral from the 1200s and turned it into something jerry jones would build <laughs> and you don't uh, 
I went to Boston and open up into a uh, baptismal pool. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love Olympic size. It's now a mega church. <laughs> Joel Osteen. <laughs> right. It's now the World arena tour. in Houston. No, I, I went to Houston. I went to the river to flow right through. I went to Boston and I uh, was waiting on Sorry. my car to get ready. I love Boston. It's, it's, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No one likes Boston. You, you stop gaslighting me. Uh, and you go into these old churches where the revolution was born and you see where like, the sign, you know, George Washington sit, sat here. Um, and, and you just touch the rail, like where George Washington was, you get to see the setting of where these historical events took place. And, and it connects you to a time in history in a way that you don't get when you read a book or that like when you go and visit a historical site, you are taken to a place and you, you can kind of get the measure of things. Uh, I just was reading a book on the, the uh, Cincinnati Turner Society and, and Turnoverans and social organization amongst immigrant Germans in the 1840s, 1850s. And I, I was reading this book and it kind of describes the streets. And then I went to Cincinnati a couple of weeks ago and I got to walk the streets where, you know, these, these same people that I'm reading this book about were. And, and you just get it gives you a new perspective. It gives you a different perspective. There's also an aspect to a building like this where it takes 250 years or like the national cathedral in Washington, DC is still ongoing or the, or the cathedral in Barcelona where they're, they're never going to finish this thing essentially where it's an ongoing project. We don't live in a world. It's like, well, if we want to rebuild it, we ought to rebuild it within the next 10 years. We ought to put some steel roofing in there, make it, up to fire code and do well, this. They used to live in a world where the only reason a building was finished was because the architect died. Right. But that's not what this is. This was a holy, it was, it was something that the, the people of Paris and the planners of this building and the church set out to build a, a temple to, to a creator. It, it had a higher significance than just a historical site where Napoleon was, was crowned. It, and therefore, a lot of care went into it that was beyond steel beams. I mean, this is the type of building, like there's something about a building where you have an entire forest gets cleared out to build this roof that just burned down. But do you and, believe that, I guess it sounds like you're, you're saying there's a certain intent it, it involved in this creation. Do you not think that that intent would be still present in the steel workers who, you know, create the new portions? I, I don't. I don't think that. Um, I don't is, think is this that, like a breakdown of humanity thing. No, I don't think so. I just think that we have an approach towards um, architecture that past generations didn't have. Like I don't, you don't see a lot of buildings that are meant to be there for, for centuries. You know, you, you think of a building that we are building today, like even, even a hundred years ago, when you look at the, and a lot of it is unnecessary. Like, look at the courthouses in Hendricks County, for instance, where I grew up. There's a beautiful courthouse that was, you know, built with a lot of care. But it's outdated. It doesn't really serve the same functional purpose. And, and you go, well, we don't really need to build that type of building anymore. Let's just build something that really serves a great purpose for 40 years, and then it's easily replaceable. But there are things that you build that don't have that same intent behind it. And so I think to, to look at this as just a building, to look at this as just even just a historical site, I don't look at it that way. I look at it from not just a historical perspective, but also from a religious perspective. This is a religious piece of art. And so you don't just slap some steel siding on the top of it because that, that may be better for building codes. It's a sacred process to build this piece of art. Um, so I'm going to disagree. Okay. Okay. Because what we now consider art was at the time the peak of their engineering um, abilities. Yes, it's yeah. beautiful because fractals are beautiful and arches are beautiful and all these things that are mathematically sound are beautiful, especially when you put them into architecture. And yes, they also had people who were looking at this with an eye for what is aesthetically pleasing. But I mean, to say that the buildings that are built today are built to last. They're built to last differently. They're, I mean, we have buildings that are built to withstand typhoons and hurricanes. Um, we now have people who think about building buildings to withstand planes flying into them. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's the durability of them. It depends on what you're trying to outlast. If you're trying to put them in the middle of a well-established European uh, city where you you know what the um, natural hazards are, it's also fairly low. Well, the biggest risk that they were running was eventually a fire. Sure. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's happened before. I saw some libertarian INTJ keep posting a picture of World War I with, with Notre Dame on fire. So I don't know if there was a yeah. fire before. But, yes. and, and 150 years ago is when the spire was built. So it's, it's been added on. It's been rehabilitated. It's mm-hmm. been redone. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so no, we're, we're, about we're that. making a big deal out of the loss of, like you said, something that's only 150 years old. It's, d- did we really lose anything? Do we well, really lose anything that can't be recreated with the same amount of craftsmanship and the same intent and focus and, and care for maybe even better design? Yeah. Are you t- yeah. Basically comparing no. like the 1900s craftsman house to like something that could be built up like some vinyl village down the street. No. See, Sarah's making a lot of sense. But then you come up with ideas and I go, what I, happened to you? I'm just saying, like, this is like crying over some craftsman house that somebody built. My dad built this house in the 1900 and some, you know, and then some boomer inherited, lit it on fire in 2019 <laughs> because they fell asleep with a cigarette in their mouth. And I'm supposed to cry. It's like, I, I mean, I think my house is old. My house is built in 1929. Right. But I go to, I have friends who even moved down here from like, in New England, and they're like, that's not an old house. They're like, yeah. I, I had a house that was built in like the 1800s, and we have a cobblestone basement that leaks, you know, six months out of the year. It's fun. That's, that's an old house. Right. Me, but then you, again, you go over to Europe, and they're like, it's not an old house. Yeah, but these, these, are, these are just, all buildings are temporal. I mean, everything on earth is temporal at the end of the day. And, and I can see that point. But at the same time, like Andrew Bowman in our, in our chat, Said, you know, I went, and when you walk in, it's overwhelming. It's breathtaking. It's, it's a space that is meant to take you to a divine place. It's not the the uh, lean to that my dad built for his tractor in the backyard out of steel siding, Harry. Like, there's, I think What's to just think that is really still like psychologically primed. Like, you go to Notre Dame, like it is a whole experience. It's not just the environment but it's also the people who are there and the music and the smells and everything that they have going into it sure. and the fact that you expect to have a moving experience because you're going to notre dame right. you expect to have a moving experience when you're going into the shed because that's a an environment that you've designed to help you to be able to be one with nature and connect with god then you may have a very moving experience there too because that's what you expect to have it's it, but it's not just about the structure. I think we're focusing too much on the structure because the way that the past communicated with us and the way that we understand the past is through th- through artwork, through architecture, through s- sculpting, through the 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 paintings that were in in a church like this. This was where a lot of this stuff and they saved some of it and some of it were, was saved and spared by like the windows, the rose windows. You know, but there are like the artifacts in Iraq after the Iraq war um, and ISIS and what they've done to a lot of the artifacts from ancient, Mm -hmm. you know, ancient Babylon and, and, and in the past, like that's how the past was communicating with us. That's how we understood our past as a species. And that's why I think buildings like this just take on a special significance. Whereas our, like my apartment has significance to the people that love me, but it doesn't have significance for communicating to the, to all of the future. Whereas this is something that is a building that was designed by the past to communicate something, not just to those people. Then they started a building knowing that it wouldn't be finished for hundreds of years Mm. that they'd never see this thing be finished. And I think that's hard for us to understand because everything has like, I want this done now. We have such an immediacy culture. And so anytime you lose a, a a building or a museum or the burning in Alexandria, you know, what a thousand years ago or in world war one in Lisbon and, and you had the burning of the library, the, the Germans came through and in the rape of Belgium and destroyed entire libraries and a, a tremendous amount of, of ancient European history. There's, there's a loss to not just us now, but also future generations. And some of that can't be recreated. And so that's, I think, when I look at this stuff, being somebody who 
really appreciates architecture, really appreciates art, really appreciates the past and history. I'm not saying you guys don't, but that's for me as I watch it. And I'm thinking about why, why is this making me sad? Like we just live in the internet age in such an immediate and temporal time that to lose anything that is communicating to the future of such permanence really bummed me out because it's something that there's some things there that just can't be recreated. You can't touch the railing that uh, 15 generations back touched. Like there's something about that feeling of walking into an old church and touching where George Washington touched or where John Adams spoke or where Paul Revere lived. And you just go, I don't know. There's, there's something, um, I don't want to say spiritual about that particular point because I don't think it's spiritual. It's, it's um, ethereal. It's it's above kind of the instant now. I don't know if that's making sense. To be I fair, think I think it would be recreatable if you just have a sign there that says that. Like, how do you know that it's not? <laughs> got a placard. She's got a great point. Seriously. All yeah. <laughs> right. A Such a skeptic. What happened to you as a? Ch- I, I'm so I'm gullible. Gonna, I'm like you should be able to be happy even understanding that like there's not these great things to cling to and like that's okay. Right. Got a plaque on this apartment complex. It used to be home side of Notre Dame. Now, you know, it's community housing. Please stop pooping in the yard. That right. used to yeah. be the altar. <laughs> right. But um, I mean, I, would I, you have some sort of moving experience if they put up a placard? This is this is this is the area that was that was burned during the you know Great Fire. Would you then have the ability to recreate that experience? You know, in inside of yourself. But also, maybe they put it in the wrong place, and that's not actually the. Well, that's, that's a big problem in the Holy Land. Yeah, that's a big problem in the Holy Land. Like, they tell you, oh, this is where Peter was cru-. Like, I, But does that I, invalidate the experience? Mm, I'm, I, that's when I get skeptical where I'm like, I, like, if you're standing on the mountain where you knew Jesus preached on that mountain, that's pretty cool. But, like, if you go to one of these shrines where this is where the Last Supper was held or this is where the, you know, then I'm kind of like, eh. It's like the relics burning in the church of the original cross. It's like if you took all the pieces of the original cross from the Middle Ages, like you could build the Empire State Building. You know, so some of that stuff I am pretty skeptical about. So there's th- some things that you're just like, ah, uh, this is not the original. This gilded gold metal crown of thorns is not the one that Jesus probably wore. You don't know that. Uh, probably, I don't, but I'm going to make a guess. at one point of time to right. be preserved because they would also know that the wood would eventually break down right, right. away. But you have to understand that the way Catholics believe this, though, relics are a whole thing. Like, right. yes. relics, they, they have magic. to be authentic. But, yeah, exactly, because they're basically magic. Right. Well, they're trying to still cover up that whole uh, paying for salvation thing in the Middle Ages. Hey, you can still do it. Hey, Anyways, the I, I see what you're saying. I give mm-hmm. credence to that. That it's a connection to the past. It helps you remind yourself of history when you see that, and it gives you basically that almost like a a fetter to the past. Mm-hmm. It, it helps anchor those feelings, those emotions, the things that you read about. It's the same thing that uh, happened into like uh, why a lot of black people don't really don't have a lot of pull to like African history because a lot of that has been destroyed mm. one um, by some by colonization by, from Europe coming down taking all of it and destroying it and using it for other things when they went to Africa and also being you know, overrun during the quote unquote African dark ages when they were invaded by the Middle Easterns and they came in and destroyed everything right yeah so those connections to the past I will you know like I understand it I get it you know, having something having a museum full of stuff it, it, it gives you a better chance of understanding, oh, wow, this thing existed as opposed to just the forgotten history. And I do see some of kind of maybe, Sarah, you'd agree with this, that if it's gone and it's forgotten and people don't remember it, then really at the end of the day, what are we missing? I, I, I don't know. I, yes, but at the same time, like, I guess this is where I go to the sentimentality that you've been expressing. That, like, that, But if... If no one, to me, it's that's the loss. If, if no one remembers it, if, if everyone forgets it, then like that's only time that you've actually lost it. I, like for me, I, rem- I was doing a, an article on the beginning of World War I, and I was like, you know, I wonder what was going on when my great-grandfather was born in 1911. And I kind of, I looked up the Italian-Russo War, and, um, you know, when he was born, that's when it was beginning. And then I found out the names of my great-great-grandparents, who were alive and having children in 1911 and it was 2013. And so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, these are the people who 
to, I mean, Sarah, you know a lot about personalities and how they're shaped. Like th- your great, great grandparents have more of an impact on your thinking patterns and your position in society than you might ever imagine. And yet I don't know, I didn't know any, I don't know any of my great, great grandparents' names. They're just forgotten. Maybe you have some dusty old photographs in your mom's house or your grandma's house, but nobody really knows. Like everybody has the Elizabeth Warren story. That's why it's, it's funny when we call her Pocahontas, but everybody kind of has that story. Like, I think I'm 116th Indian, but okay. when my, I think okay. I'm mostly German. But then when my sister gets her DNA test, she we're, we're all British. Like you go, we, we even, we don't even really connect to the generations that lived a hundred years ago. We don't even know who our direct ancestors are. And, and it's disappointing. It's kind of like, we don't understand our own history. So I think I think I, one of the differences I want to kind of look at there is the difference between memory and documentation, or memory and 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 written word, yeah, or um, archival uh, records. Because I, I also am really like into a lot of genealogy, so I've I've looked into a lot of my ancestors and things, things, people that nobody in my family can remember what this person was like. But I can go through all of these records and I can find stories in these records. I can find narrative accounts sometimes. There are, there are letters. I mean, if you know, if you go and look through the archives in the states that your families came from, sometimes you can find handwritten letters. Mm. And so at that point, you've almost revived that memory. So has it actually been lost if there's still a record of it? Right. Or is it maybe just not, it's dormant. Is it something that's maybe just not being used right now? And part of the fascinating nature of humanity is that not only are we able to pass along stories and you know traditions and culture, but we've also figured out how to store up more knowledge and more stories and more traditions than we ever could use, than, than one person can actually you know contain in themselves. But they all can be recalled at any time. I mean, we have it. Latin is an entire language that nobody speaks, but because we have it recorded, because we have it, you know, uh, we have it saved in this way, we still are able to use it when there are people who want to recall that up and, and bring it back up again. So is it really still lost or is it just something that's not, you know, used in modern times? Right. Yeah. Thank you, J.K. Rowling. Um, Badger pride. <laughs> what? I didn't get that. Because you oh, said Buffs. Latin. Hufflepuff, Badger Pride. Oh, okay. Because she said Latin. A lot of the things that get people to speak Latin at one point of time was the Harry Potter books that were mm. coming out Latin. Anybody who ever wants to learn how to like set a book on fire has to learn a little bit of Latin. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's jump into WikiLeaks because I think that the conversation around no tra- like everybody's talking about whether Julian Assange did anything wrong. But Sarah, do you find a lot of people on your travels on the internet, Harry, you as well, do you find a lot of people even remember what, what Julian Assange really did? And that's like been in the last decade, like the last nine years. So there is some confusion as to why the U.S. is the one who are getting their hands on him and not Sweden. Mm. Um, because all, basically all we have to charge him with is, is you, at least the understanding is you let out state secrets. You know, he, he, they leaked Eventually, what we look through and like any good, you know, leak, you look through and you're like, hey, let's look at all the terrible things the government's been doing. <laughs> right. So I wanted to, uh, we have some great research notes from our, our great researcher, Sam Schultz. And uh, I am going to include this in the show notes so you can check this out. We won't go. They're wonderful. Every, aren't they great? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Um, yes, I always appreciate the ability of our research teams to produce far more research than I could actually like remember. So uh, they should have your computer in front of you. It's exactly right. Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to go through everything because I don't want to uh, just read this and, and kind of get into the, that whole reading thing. But, you know, and Sarah, feel free to kind of interrupt where you want to add some color commentary. Same with you, Harry. I know you probably have a lot to say on Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, but let's start with who Julian Assange is. And he's the founder of WikiLeaks, long targeted by the U.S. for his role in releasing secret government documents. And a lot of those pertain to the U.S. and the Middle East and the detention of people in Guantanamo Bay, uh, the 2016 
uh, elections. Uh, he's come under attack for releasing thousands of emails stolen from the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign, and those damaged Hillary Clinton. He's long time. He's been a long foe of Hillary Clinton. Uh, in 2010, his biggest score was the releasing of diplomatic cables um, that greatly embarrassed the Hillary Clinton uh, diplomatic uh, core <laughs> that she ran. And then she was uh, less than a fan of Julian Assange. And then in 2016, when he got his hands from Russian hackers on those emails, he was more than happy to release those. Um, his suicide. I mean, wouldn't so you? Yeah, right. Uh, if you're going to pick a foe in politics, Hillary Clinton would be the perfect one. Well, and once you've already got a foe, like you might as well double down. Exactly right. Um, what are you going to do? Try really and kill you? you? Yeah, she's yeah. only suicide you once. Right. Uh, in November of 2018, a court filing revealed that justice de- the Justice Department had prepared an indictment against Assange. And essentially, it says that uh, American prosecutors have charged Assange with conspiring to hack a government computer. And the U.S. charged Assange with one count of conspiracy to hack a computer related to his role in 2010 and the release of secret American documents. This single charge stems from what prosecutor said was his agreement to break a password to a classified U.S. government computer. It was not an espionage charge, a detail that press freedom advocates had watched closely. And so Assange even is starting to kind of break away from his own group, asking whether he still loved WikiLeaks. Uh, in October 2016, after the organization published the hacked emails, um, oh, Trump said, I know nothing about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. So not Assange. Trump said he doesn't know anything about WikiLeaks, but he also loves WikiLeaks. Uh, a dual th- thing coming from Donald Trump is not necessarily... I gotta love the selective. Oh, no, I don't know anything about that. I, <laughs> I'm so proud of France for putting out the fire. The church is so beautiful. It'll be bigger and better than ever. Do they use water bombs? You are literally making the, the Trump argument, Harry. We're going to build it bigger and better than ever. Let's put a big hotel on the top of it. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I think it'd be great. Golden. So, so uh, in 2013, the Obama DOJ decided not to prosecute Assange for publishing classified information. Um, they charged that government employees and contractors, mainly Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning, uh, for leaking classified information instead of charging Assange under, instead of getting into a First Amendment fight. So, Matthew he said Miller. It's not worth it. Right. And so a Justice Department spokesperson, Matthew Miller, said the problem the department has always had investigating Julian Assange is there's no way to prosecute him for publishing information without the same theory being applied to journalists. And if you're going to prosecute journalists for publishing classified information, which the department is not, there's no way to prosecute Assange. And so this thing that they want to charge him for carries a five year sentence. Uh, and the, the, he spent seven years basically in prison in this uh, Ecuadorian embassy. Um, so he won't, the UK won't extradite someone for facing the death penalty, so they're just saying it's just for this charge, but they could flip and go after him for espionage after all this. And, and Sam makes a great point in the notes that why would they go through all of this effort to lock him up for just five years? But I think it may just be more the symbology of it as well. So, symbology. Symbology. Yeah. I, did I make up a word? Um, <laughs> so the Chelsea Manning at the time, um, Chelsea Manning. Let's just leave it there. Uh, leaked war crimes, basically video of Reuters journalists being killed by. American drones, I think it was. No. All right. So, okay. Okay. Whoa. All right. All right. This is I maximum re ahead. Trying to calm down because like Geraldo Herrera was up there on Fox and going like, and they were talking about this damn footage, right? That Chelsea l- leaked out, right? right. The video is called Collateral Murder. Go watch it. That video was a U.S. helicopter shooting on Reuters reporters after the U.S. military tried to cover that up. Right. They shot reporters after this was after we already spent, what, eight months talking about how we was upset about a government sh- killing a journalist and then trying to cover it up. Yeah. So in 2007, 
Um, WikiLeaks post a video on April 5th, 2010, post a video showing U.S. military helicopter flying on and killing several Iraqi civilians in 2007. The military claims that the helicopter crew believed the targets were armed insurgents. Now, in July 25th, 2010, um, they post more than 90,000 classified documents related to the Afghanistan war. Uh, now, a lot of these cables... Uh, really embarrassed the American government. Mm -hmm. The video of called collateral murder really embarrassed the American government. And then on August 20th, a month after those classified documents, Swedish prosecutors issue a warrant for his arrest based on allegations of sexual assault. Those have now gone away. Um, they've been dropped. Um, the I had actually read that they... Um, were brought back up recently because he'd been ex extradited. It was the woman who had accused him because the um, statute of limitations hasn't actually run out yet. Okay. Um, they they dropped it because they couldn't prosecute him because they couldn't get him in the in the country. So let me so, just kind of let me go through his timeline because I think giving the details here first that'll kind of help shade some of our our conversations a little bit. Um, you know, WikiLeaks is founded in '06 by Assange. Um, in 07, they post the procedures manual for Guantanamo Bay. In September 2008, they post emails from Sarah Palin's Yahoo account. In April of 2010, they, the, the collateral murder video comes out. 90,000 classified documents uh, a couple months later. A uh, month after that, in 2010, Swedish prosecutors issued the arrest warrant. October 22, 2010, WikiLeaks publishes classified military documents from the Iraq War. Um, November 28, 2010, the Stockholm Criminal Court issues an international arrest warrant for Assange. Uh, in December 7, 2010, he turns himself into London authorities and he remains in custody. Uh, he is then released on bail and put on house arrest a few days later. Uh, a judge rules in support of Assange's extradition in early 2011. They file an appeal, and then WikiLeaks in April of 2011 begins releasing classified military documents providing detail on the behavior and treatment of detainees held at Guantanamo Bay. Then, September 2nd, 2011, WikiLeaks releases more than a quarter million U.S. diplomatic cables. Um, November 2nd, they uh, vote to extradite him to Sweden. Um... That goes on for a while. Assange, in June 19, 2012, enters the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, he's, he's granted asylum there. And uh, the last time we really kind of see him in public is uh, August 19, 2012. Um, August 13, 2015, Swedish prosecutors announced they're dropping allegations involving sexual molestation and coercion as statutes of limitations in the investigation run out. However, the allegation of suspicion of rape still stands, and he may be investigated until 2020. Uh, in 2016, he publishes 20,000 DNC emails, shows basically the DNC rigging things in favor of Hillary Clinton. Um, let's see. Uh, October 7, 2016, WikiLeaks begins publishing the Podesta emails. Um, the Trump campaign or the Trump presidency, basically Jeff Sessions says it's a priority to arrest Assange. Uh, and then he's arrested on April 11th. Um, it, somewhere in between there in the last couple months, uh, he released something from the CIA and Pompeo basically said he's a terrorist group, an informational uh, and a non-state uh, espionage group or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, so, a lot of his crimes, quote unquote, according to the United States government, there, there really aren't crimes. Basically, what he's done is he's taken people who have technically committed a crime by taking information from the federal government, and then he just publishes it. Like the diplomatic cables, the cables from Afghanistan, Iraq, you, these... It, it, he basically does, like, it's the Pentagon Papers. There's a great movie with Tom Hanks about the Pentagon Papers where they're wrestling with how do we take what Daniel Ellsberg has basically copied from the Pentagon on misdeeds in the, in the Vietnam War. How do we print that in a responsible way? The Supreme Court gets involved at one point, and uh, 
the the Washington Post really wrestles with taking this classified information that the public needs to know. Now, what journalists will typically do, like the the New York Times in their great podcast, The Daily, talked about um, working with WikiLeaks on these diplomatic cables and what were they going to publish, looking at the State Department saying, sorry, we're still going to publish this stuff, even though it embarrasses you. Uh, the press is there supposedly to print what keeps the government accountable, mm -hmm. even though we know that usually it just prints whatever the government wants. Um, what WikiLeaks has done has been embarrassing to the State Department, to the United States government. And you always get this line from Sessions and Pompeo and Hillary Clinton at the time. They're putting, he's putting lives at danger. Well, wouldn't you think that the press that gets all of their information directly from the security ser services, as we've seen in the Russia investigation, if one person had died in the last 10 years as a result of anything that WikiLeaks has done, don't you think you'd know that name and know that picture? Like, at what point are we just going to stop buying that bullshit argument that WikiLeaks presenting war crimes is somehow against is somehow putting lives at danger. I mean, is that an argument that you two would would say that's fairly simplistic or I agree? Let's start with Sarah. I mean, I, I think it's it always comes back to this this whole well, there's you know it's it's sensitive information. It's putting somebody's life at risk. But you to me that's not a really valid argument because you're arguing that one person's life is more important than another's only because they've been put in a particular position because they are you know because they're in a state appointed position usually which then kind of ignores okay but we just found out all these terrible things that has been done on behalf of the state mm -hmm. so, i mean i don't i think it's an overly simplistic argument i can see how people get there but i think they maybe haven't kind of thought it all the way through or, or there is often and oftentimes there is a really clear like valuation of one life over another that well these people are people who especially when they're talking about like military secrets like oh now you put the lives of um you know of green berets and, and navy seals at risk and these people are our heroes and they're worth more and i i don't particularly agree with that but it is an argument at least i understand right Aaron? Yeah, because that argument is the, the simple fact that you are producing like these unredacted statements. You're basically have the possibility inside these documents doxing somebody that possibly where they are in a position of what something that they said could get them in trouble, possibly something, something. You know, I can see the Jeopardy argument on, on it, but at the exact same time, it is, well, you know, you kind of put them there. <laughs> right you're you put them there you're saying that the lives of of the mythical cia agent that might be hurt in or the state department employee that might be compromised their life is more valuable than the 15 iraqi civilians like the, a lot yeah, of what i'm saying uh, yeah, uh, yeah right yeah. and the other thing is like without some of these leaks we the american public didn't know what the heck was going on for the longest time to be anti-war in this country was, you know, you know, could be burnt, you know, basically burnt at the stake. Yeah. Like, you don't care not, anything about security. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we're there. It's a humanitarian version. We're yeah, there. Not only is it security, it's you don't care about those other people because we are bombing them out of love. This is we are trying to make their areas better because you don't understand, you know, that this is what's necessary. Yeah, we wouldn't know about Yemen, for instance, and America's involvement in Yemen if it weren't for WikiLeaks. Right. And their leaking of that said information mm -hmm. and, and making that available. A lot of what the, the state cables were, I remember we covered it on the show. It was that Hillary Clinton had to have awkward phone calls with the Chinese because diplomats were saying bad things about the Chinese and North Korea. And, and it put them in an awkward position. And how can you have statecraft if, if all of our secret cables are being exposed? Well, I don't know about you. Like, how do you answer that? Like, I, I think for people who are newer to maybe to non-interventionism or, or maybe don't believe in non-interventionism, that makes that's a palatable argument. How can you have statecraft of any type or diplomacy if everybody knows what you're saying? I mean, it seems like an untenable system, Sarah. 
Well, I mean, I guess you're, you're, you're basing that system, though, on deception, that the idea being that we need to have a, an advantage over everyone else and that that advantage is having asymmetric information in one way or another. You know, you loop back into that problem of well, you're, you live in a world where if that's the assumption, why are you assuming that everybody else doesn't also have the same assumption? Right. They do. We assume everyone else has just the same amount of intelligence. And so you, it, you, what you do is you engender a world where there's not um, trust built into that. And I mean, that's kind of the key to any society, but especially in statecraft and world diplomacy is that you have to have some level of trust with other countries. And yes, you should have um, a degree of understanding of when countries are not your allies, but if you are to have allied countries, like, yeah, it causes huge problems when our allies find out we're spying on them because, (laughs) hey, that's kind of like when you find out that your your boyfriend is going through your phone. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we had an agreement. Right. Yeah, 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 and that's why we get so upset with all these. Like, I can't believe Yahweh and, and the Chinese government is spying on all this. Did you not know because of Edward Snowden? We knew that the U.S. government was putting all kinds of spying stuff in the Cisco routers and pulling everyone's traffic through the Prism system. That was a all these U.S. based stuff, and a lot of these other countries weren't trying to use U.S. based routers and switches. Hmm? I think I think if you, you had told that? if you had told people. In 2005, uh-huh. that we're going to put a device in your pocket or put a little round trash can in your bedroom, and we're going to hire 100,000 employees here at Amazon to listen to said conversations, I think there would be massive outrage. But I think what younger people may not realize is how, how much we know, thanks to Edward Snowden, WikiLeaks, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, you, you now know that every piece of information, that the government was going to hide from you the fact that every piece of digital communication on face, the face of the earth is stored in Utah by the United States government. Like, we didn't know that until Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald. And, and mm-hmm. what Julian Assange has really done is what journalists do every single day. They get a source and then they provide information based on that source right. he does it in a messier way and that he dumps it yeah and, and lets he other people journalistic ethics that they think right kind of what a lot of journalists consider to define journalism as opposed to just you know disseminating information recklessly yeah and i think people need to understand that that's still journalism even if it's maybe not up to a certain journalistic standard what julian assange has done is that he has exposed war criminals he has exposed government criminals and those people have never been held to account it's people like edward snowden and chelsea manning and julian assange that the government wants to prosecute Mm -hmm. and that should make every citizen of the united states stop and go wait a minute to expose war criminals is a crime in and of itself what kind of system are we actually building here yeah Sarah. No, I guess there's it's it's a really different. I find when we have a lot of these conversations, especially around like foreign policy, that it's almost that you're dealing with a very very different fundamental worldview, um, one in which you kind of have to look at the the really core beliefs under that. Like, do you believe that people in America are equal to people in Iraq? Yeah. You believe that they are capable of the same things. And do you believe that they deserve the same amount of respect and liberty? Um, I'm, I'm always shocked by the amount of conservative Christians or people who call themselves Christians who somehow think that a life of a person born in America is worth more than the human life of the person born in Haiti or China or Russia or wherever. Like there seems to be some disconnect on the right or, or really just in general. I think most people have it. That I, I think that if you're a person who, uh, who claims to be a Christian and wraps yourself in the flag, and yet you don't understand the inherent human dignity of every person breathing breath on this planet, I just have to question, like, why do you believe what you believe? Because it doesn't make any sense to me. If you think that a Yemeni's life is worth less than a, a uh, CIA spy's because he has the American label, like, that's that's kingdoms of the earth as opposed to kingdoms of heaven. And I just have never understood that, that disconnect from Republicans specifically because they claim to be so holy. 
<laughs> it's usually the brown skin. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, that, that, that's an easy argument, easy, easy dig for it. But when you right. go back to the other argument and say, like, all these people that know this stuff, they don't, no, they don't. No one don't. Nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody, no, nobody knows. Nobody cares. Uh, and if they do know, they kind of remember it, but they don't. They don't. People are still on Facebook. People still use Google. People still use all this other stuff. They don't know. They love Alexa. They, you could tell everyone, you could tell everyone that you're blue in your face that that thing is listening to them and they don't give a damn. Right. They don't know. They, they, they don't know. And if they don't know, they do not care. They prefer the convenience of it all. Even when you're trying to ignore them or somebody really wants to listen to you, they can. Right. Right. Carry around your cell phone in your pocket. Like, are you really that interesting? (laughs) No, trust me. You've heard the show. I mean, yeah, and that's the other thing is that we, we go to such efforts to actively broadcast ourselves now. Yeah. And then we're going to get really worked up about privacy. What? Well, it's all right. The thing is, you have to worry about privacy because the privacy is not for the people who like uh, probably for you. Privacy isn't for you then. Privacy probably isn't for Chris. Privacy is for that person that does need it. That person, that whistleblower, that person that needs to be private of something that they are doing to list out those secrets. Because remember, the Chelsea Manning only really got caught because she couldn't protect herself from her own stuff. She kept blabbing. Well, privacy is also for the people they're blowing the whistle on. Correct. Right. They need the privacy. That's why the privacy needs to be there. That the whistleblowers need it. People who do well, that. No, but what I'm saying is that they're violating the privacy of the people they're blowing the whistle on. Yeah. So is privacy this? perfectly important thing that must be always respected or is it something that is kind of variable and depends on what you're using that privacy for well the thing is when it comes to like a state agency like well they're using government stolen monies to go sit there there and go murder people so like for damn their privacy they're hurting people yeah so you're saying that they inherently don't have the right to exist as a as a tool of death <laughs> paid for by stolen money right so you don't get privacy yeah I, and I, I wouldn't i mean i'm i'm Not really give privacy to the death machine i'm really libertarian that up but like i think there i think we should probably flesh that out i think that um when you're when you're when you're talking about something that is funded by the public sector that i own a piece of i want to know where my money's going and if my money is going to war crimes I have every right to know what my income is being used to do, especially if it's being used to kill people because it's so antithetical to my values. Why can you use the argument of privacy or secrecy for a government when inherently it's not meant to be secret? The whole point is that governments are not supposed to be secret. Everything is supposed to be transparent so you can control it as a citizen. Harry, did no. I stump you? No, no, no. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. To me, like, it, that's the thing with it. it. It is because what they do in the shadows is, you know, they hurt people. They take away people's liberties and freedom. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that, that. They're basically, quote, unquote, taking away their privacy. But at the same time, they're exposing the um, human rights violations that they're t- you know taken away so that circumvents all of that mm-hmm. that's not more of a like removing their privacy that's reporting a crime right sarah what do you think i, I mean i'm i fall in the realm of if there's if there's force being used if there's coercion being used then there needs to be transparency um i mean i'm, I'm a big believer of in general if, if you're going to have some sort of regulation or some sort of rule it needs to be one that's not you know that's not cut and dry that like you can't have any sort of opt out of it ideally. But even then, like you have to let people know that it's in place. Right. Yeah. So let's go back to the journalist. You ignore it then. Like we do with all of the terms of service. We know exactly <laughs> what they're grabbing. We don't care. So let's go back to the journalist angle um, and go back to our notes because there's a couple different interesting angles that I want to cover here. Um, and then we'll start to, to wrap it up. Um, many in the MSM dislike Julian Assange and do their best to discredit him as a journalist. So the Washington Post editorial board wrote, Mr. Assange is not a free press hero. Yes, WikiLeaks acquired and published secret government documents, many of them newsworthy as shown by their subsequent use in newspaper articles, including the Post. Contrary to the norms of journalism, however, Mr. Assange sometimes obtained such records unethically, including according to separate federal indictments unsealed Thursday by trying to help now 
former U.S. soldier Chelsea Manning, hack into a classified U.S. computer system. Also, unlike real journalists, WikiLeaks dumped material into the public domain without any effort independently to verify its factuality or give named individuals an opportunity to comment. Nor, needless to say, would a real journalist have cooperated with a plot by an authoritarian regime intelligence service to harm one U.S. presidential candidate to benefit another. To the contrary, Mr. Assange's transfer to U.S. custody, followed by possibly additional Russia-related charges or his conversion into a cooperating witness, could be the key to learning more about Russia intelligence efforts to undermine democracy in the West. Certainly, he is long overdue for personal accountability. So that is the, the press's... The, the Washington Post's, he's not a journalist. I've said it forever. Wait until they start wanting the federal government to license journalists. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, well, you, kind I, of, I guess, you kind of scoffed at one point, Sarah. What'd you scoff well, at? It sounds like what they're, the, the difference that they're making is, is kind of, they're basically asserting that journalism requires uh, essentially filtering. It requires some sort of, um, you're going through and you at least know what you are, what kind of information you're putting out there. And, they're asserting that Assange is not a journalist, he's a hacker. He's someone who just goes and steals the information and then throws it out to everyone. So you go through it and you do the journalism on it, um, but that he doesn't actually do that part himself. I mean, and I, I, it's, I can see it as an argument. I don't necessarily think that, that means he's any less deserving. Uh, I, to me, that's, okay, so you did the investigative part of the investigative journalism? Right. <laughs> you did the interpretation part. So Tucker Carlson on Fox News gave the alternate. Do you have something you want to say? Uh, if he's a hacker, then yeah, he's a hacker. Hackers are heroes. Hackers are great people. Yeah, there's white hat hackers all the day. What? Why no, are hackers hack heroes? Because I think there are a lot of people listening going, what is he talking about? They're stealing my security, social security number. It's not a hacker. Hackers are people who, who can take something that and use it for something that is, you know, for different means. They go by and they basically hack the system for you. A lot of the different things that you take for granted or just hacks of different things. If you, if you like, I will never use hack software. Well, if you're using your Mac, <laughs> you're wrong. You're using hack software right there. Anyways, but the thing, but because hackers are heroes, what they're, what they're hating on is the ultimate term of crackers or people or malicious bad actors. Those mm -hmm. are the people that take those social security cards, stuff like that. Those are malicious bad actors when they try to put on the easy term of oh, i'll just call them hackers these are bad people no no that's not what that is okay hackers are great people hackers are heroes that's why like if you want to meet some he some local heroes find your local hacker space okay or they call them maker spaces because the term hacker you know some people just take it with that but trust me hackers are great people hmm. and they want to label them as that so it's that scary unknown that's scary like we will label him a hacker because then it makes them separate and right. people are so scared of that world because they've made uh, because it's easy to be scared because they have allowed this it, th these terrible institutions to be to exist with terrible security and these bad actors have taken advantage of it. Mm -hmm. So the reason uh, I'm trying to turn myself here, like uh, I was getting ready to go on a terrible tangent. I apologize, but like your social security, that's what is it? Seven numbers? Come on. <laughs> Guesses at random based on someone's birth. And you can probably guess the sequence of numbers, which is their social security number. And then you can probably just go and take a, uh, create a small al al algorithm to take that and understand and find an entire family of social security number. This is not difficult, okay? I did it just because I couldn't remember my sisters and I needed to fill out some forms. And I guessed correctly. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, well, so, uh, that was a joke. He was kidding about that federal government. This is all for entertainment. He didn't mean that at all. There was no forgery whatsoever, insurance company. I'm helping you. Say, yeah, I was kidding. Yeah, yeah. Prank call, prank call, prank call. Allegedly. Prank call, allegedly. Allegedly, prank call. Oh, oh. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> Sarah, you ever admitted to forgery while you're on the podcast? Uh, not in a uh, recordable environment, no. That's, right. that's okay, legal. good. <laughs> just kidding no okay yeah, yeah I would, but the, it's Mr. okay yeah and that's <laughs> yeah and that's the thing they want to separate them from like um, um 
they want to separate them from the journalists. It's because it's, it's easier. You, you, right. you call them the other, the scary other, the scary thing over there, because this way, when they go after him and do anything with him, well, it's because he's, he tried to hack. Look, he's he was trying to hack us. That's the problem. Yeah. Well, John Stewart put it perfectly. The, the media is its own identity group that is trying to protect itself right now and trying to so i i'm i'm working on a podcast called leaders and legends it's a really great show i'd love for you to check it out and download that and make me look good but you also learn a lot about how local government works and uh we did an interview yesterday with a, a journalist and they said our local newspaper here in indianapolis the indianapolis star 10 years ago 2008 okay 200 journalists working in the newsroom okay what would you guess that number is today? 32. 60. That's a lot. I was going to say uh, around 50, yeah. Yeah, Cleveland had the Cleveland Plain Dealer 300 in 2008, and today it's 50 it's for a city the size of Cleveland. So, Because so they're, they're still trying to figure out their funding model again. I mean, it's right. completely collapsed, and that creative destruction hasn't fully kicked in. Well, their funding model only existed because they had a monopoly. Right. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason that funding model, model even existed. So, like, those journalists can still be journalists. It's just got to find out a different funding model, and, you, and it's separated. So, without that government-controlled monopoly, there won't, just won't be one big journalist. There's probably more, quote-unquote, journalists than they probably have ever been. Mm-hmm. It's just they just don't work for these big companies and get counted. Right. Uh, so, Tucker Carlson gave the opposite view uh on fox news assange's real sin was prevent i'm doing my best tucker carlson cadence uh assange's real sin was preventing hillary clinton from becoming president there was a time not so long ago when reporters didn't applaud the arrest of other journalists for publishing information at nbc when they tell you many believe something it means they believe it carlson said about the network's coverage of assange the guardians of speech are now its enemies The people charged with policing power are now colluding with it. There's a reason you see John Brennan on the NBC all the time. They're all on the same team. We're not saying this, we're not saying any of this to defend Julian Assange. We just want to be absolutely clear about who hurts this country more. It's not him. So what's going on here? A couple of things. First, Julian Assange embarrassed virtually everyone in power. He published documents that undermined the official story on the Iraq war in Afghanistan. He got Debbie Wasserman Schultz fired from the DNC. He humiliated Hillary Clinton by showing that the Democratic primaries were, in fact, rigged. Pretty much everyone in Washington has a reason to hate Julian Assange. Rather than just admit that, he made us look like buffoons, so now we're going to send him to prison. They're announcing him as, you guessed it, a Russian agent. And I think that's pretty much what this is. This is a person who is providing a public service that embarrassed the people in power and they're looking to get revenge and create whatever concoction of charges they can find to put him behind behind bars for the rest of his life. Look at what they've done to Ross Ulbricht. You know, here's a guy who created a website Mm -hmm. that the Silk Road, which sold on the quote unquote black market and uh, on the dark web, the scary dark web, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you know more about Ross and why he's in jail, Harry. I mean, wh- why is Ross Ulbricht in jail for the rest of his life? What did he do that was so terrible that he got a life sentence? Ran a website. That's it. Okay. He ran a website, a scary website. That sold, did what? And sold the, and the website facilitated sales between people of items that the government either did not like or people didn't have licenses to sell them through in- interstates. So mm-hmm. it basically took peaceful interactions through other peaceful people to sell items. That's about it. Okay. Were some of the items, quote unquote, illegal from the federal government? Sure was, but possibly. But some of the items were illegal, but just people just sold it on it. Heck yeah. There was some like hot sauces on there that like, you would call it like illegally hot. You know, they were sold. And I wish I would have bought them. I just didn't, couldn't tell myself to, you know, give rid of the um, Bitcoins just for this illegal hot, you know, <laughs> hot sauce, you know. But, and then everything, and they did everything just like they're doing to Julian Assange to demonize Ross Albert before his case. They right. kept talking about this murder for hire case. This whole, like, oh, he got these people and he's this kingpin and he got this murder for hire. Those charges never brought to court, never really foolishly f- charged. And now they, and they got, you know, and they got taken away with prejudice. So they can never bring brought up because he never got to defend himself on it. But the only time it got brought up for was for the public, for the public opinion, and for sentencing. Mm-hmm. And he's, now he's serving a double life sentence for 
a website. Right. Just a website. That's it. So he did. He put code, ran code, and let it go. Sarah? I mean, I agree. I like the way you framed that. He essentially, like, if anything, he took government force out of the equation yeah. to make it a more peaceful interaction. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. you know, it's... It's, it's the same thing with, like, you're Foster always, and Sesta. What, you're, what always, the, yeah, you're always going to be able to find a way to, uh, you know, to ban or to illegalize, criminalize the people that you want to criminalize. Like, you just have to find the right justification and the right combination of things that play well publicly, at the very least. I mean, that's how we got our drug laws to begin with that didn't actually have much to do with caring about who was doing, you know, drugs. It had to do with, hey, this is something that particular groups are already using, and we want to criminalize those groups. Correct. Yeah, right. We want to put pressure. We want to arrest their leaders. We want to put, um, you know, cops in their neighborhood, and we can bust them some stuff. And that's why most of the drug busts are marijuana busts because you you can mm-hmm. smell marijuana. You can smell it. Right. The other drugs you can't smell it. I walk in every day at four thirty, and my neighbors yeah. are enjoying yeah, that somebody, fine plant. Because you described to me the smell of cocaine. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Oh, oh I, I can. You have to get very very close <laughs> and use a straw. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of numb. Right, yeah. And that's the other thing is, and cops will more actually go after uh, marijuana buzz than they would go co- cocaine. One, because a couple pounds of marijuana, not that expensive. They're probably just going to take the drug charge, okay? Mm-hmm. A pound or plus of cocaine, you're getting, it's a shootout. We're sh- you're getting shot at. This is a half a million dollars worth of cocaine. Guns are getting drawn. Mm-hmm. So why would I go after the cocaine dealer when the weed guy is just going to roll over for me and get in the back of the car? I think if you are skeptical of Julian Assange, you need to really think about why, why are you skeptical of what's going on in social media right now? If you're anti-Zuckerberg because he's getting into bed with the existing power structures of the media and the federal government, then why would you, if you don't like Zuckerberg for that reason, then why would you dislike Julian Assange for creating a system mm-hmm. that allows you to understand secrets that your government wants to keep hidden from you. These are not secrets that are actually endangering people. These are just secrets that are embarrassing to people like Hillary Clinton. So I guess I don't get Sarah, and then we'll start to give our final thoughts on this. Why a lot of people are anti Julian Assange. Is it just tribalism? Is it, is it because libertarians of today were good conservatives in 2008 and didn't like that he hacked Sarah Palin's emails? I mean, is it just a hangover from, from their former beliefs? I mean, some of it is certainly tribalism. There's been a, there's been a fun meme going around as to your, your, your guide as to whether or not you're supposed to hate WikiLeaks, depending on which <laughs> team you're on. <laughs> right. you know, um, but I also, there is, there is genuinely, uh, and I think it's in more of like the conservative um, contingency of, of voters that, really truly believes that there is a, an inherent value to the idea of state secrecy, that there are some things that, that the state is going to have to do horrible things, and that the, the reason that we have a state is because those are things that individuals, you know, couldn't, shouldn't be expected to do by themselves, and like this is something that we're, one of the goods of government is literally like offloading this terrible thing onto, you know, the government. Um, and I don't personally agree with that, but it is a worldview that I've heard espoused pretty consistently. You know, the idea that, yes, there are going to, it, torture is necessary, for example, is something I've heard said. It, yeah, it is, it's a terrifying thing to hear, but it's used too well because sometimes there are situations in which that's necessary. And the reason that we have a government is because somebody has to be there to do the things that have to be done. Right. I mean, it's the same argument that gets you to justify the idea of a whole world police as to why America needs to intervene because somebody has to and you have to use that force which you've given only to the state. Well, when you have to use it for things that can be considered, well, it's just a tough choice. If you have a different value set, you know, underlying those choices, then it comes out a different way. Yeah. All right, let's start wrapping up. Give our final thoughts for the episode. Uh, Harry, would you? Uh, no, ladies, I'll let I'll let Sarah choose. Would you like to go first, or would you want to make Harry go first? I make Harry go first because I just right. talked. Right. <laughs> See, she's a broadcaster. She understands separation. Good job, Sarah. I'm an amateur with uh, coffee. <laughs> I know. Yes, you've got beepers going on in the background. It happened once. I remember to turn it off this time. This here, here's the thing that's always got me with this is in the Julian Assange hate, especially the current group of Julian Assange hate, haters. The same group that's for hating him right now wants the 
Mueller report unredacted. Just up want it. Right. Who in their right mind right now, they, they can look at everyone they know would actually rele- release that unredacted. Is it Julian Assange? Mm-hmm. I, that's the only person name I can think of. Yeah. I know Tapper ain't. <laughs> right. <laughs> the journalistic ethics are going to get in the way of things that we need to know. Exactly. You know, and so you clearly want government reports unredacted. And so now, but, but since this guy released stuff that you didn't like, now you're on this other team. Mm-hmm. The, it is sickening to watch um, the group that quote unquote called themselves anti-war, peace, freedom of speech, and just watch them keep going down this, this route because the same people that were um, used to be on the side of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and all these other people that even made the, the fifth estate, that movie about Julian Assange, all these movies about how great of a hero he was and, it's all almost kind of down spit on his name because yeah. Trump, Trump derangement syndrome. And it's ridiculous. It's just the one thing I love to say this too, is that if I think it's terrible, especially if they bring him down for hacking, especially this mild form of hacking, suggesting that he could hack something or some right. mild, like talking about it. That's dangerous. Yeah. You know, it's well, hacking's dangerous, Harry. No, hacking is just a tool. Going through and looking at and re- realizing how you could use something for other purposes or repurposing stuff like that. That's it's like saying writing is dangerous. Right. Right. Yeah. E- exactly. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. Well, cursive is dangerous. But, the, it's, it's, it, but at the end of the day, it's the same code people. But it's, it is hacking and code is, is speech. And. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we're talking about the people who want to lock Julian Assange up, the people who want to, you know, their impulse, if you really sat them down, would license journalists, the people who are trying to control what Facebook allows on their platforms. Right. They are anti-free speech. Right. The people who are, and Car- Tucker Carlson made that point, and it's true. The people who are the denizens of free speech, they're for their free speech. Mm-hmm. They're for protecting their interests. They're not for protecting your free speech or my free speech they're not for the the uh the allowance of all ideas to be on the table and discussed no these are the people who are trying to get rid of people like alex jones or milo yiannopoulos or like the way that you fight what alex jones says about 9 11 is what we did at the beginning of the program Mm -hmm. you say this is why this doesn't make sense it's not ban alex jones because all you end up doing is creating conspiracy theorists about a church burning. It, it, it doesn't, the people that are trying to ban hacking or ban coding are the same people who want to ban free speech. So it makes total sense that they don't understand that. Correct. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, I think you said it right. And I'll end on this. Like speech is code. Cryptocurrency is math uh, and gold is just chemistry. That's all it is. Deep. Sarah, final thoughts? Oh, gosh, you want me to follow that deep thought up? It's really good. Uh, yes, well, feel free to self-promote, too. I don't know if you can or want to plug what you're doing um, or where people can follow you or any of that. But, you know, give your, give your final thoughts. But make sure you plug uh, what, you're, what you're up to. and how. Um, well, I'm, I've been trying to do the social media thing more since I'm traveling more. So please feel free to follow me. I'm, I'm on Instagram sometimes. Um, uh, it's, uh, my Instagram handle is freedomfemme. So Please feel free that. At, it, it is uh, freedom, F R E E D O M, fem, F E M M E. That means chick who looks like a chick. <laughs> but it's leftist speak because I speak fluent leftist. Thank you very much. You do. You are my, you are my ambassador to all things SJW. I need you. It's because they see the purple hair and they're like, you're one of us. And then they're like, why are you talking about free markets? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's. Please explain feminism to me, Sarah. I don't understand. Oh, I'm so excited. I got it. I'm going to have an opportunity to talk on how free markets benefit women. Ooh. Yes. Is there, are you recording stuff like this? Can we post this stuff somewhere? Or? I mean, we can always do independent things with, with We Are Libertarians that don't necessarily need to be connected to my work. But okay. um, who knows? We well, could actually do a partnership, too. You've got a blank check. Whatever you want to do, you do it. Yes. Well, you know what? That is actually something we were we recently talking about. We're going to start a um a series of uh, wall dailies mm-hmm. on. And what did we determine to calling it is emotional literacy one hundred and one. 
Yes, I think we need it desperately. And I'm its main student, trust me, but um, I don't know. We just need more yeah. emotion. We need a more, more emotional literacy in our lives, Harry. We're going to talk about all the feelings. Yes. All yep. <laughs> what are they? How do I identify them? What to do with them? Yeah. I just slid a rotary pick in her uh, DMs and then uh, then blocked myself. <laughs> uh, Sarah, so any th- anything that you want to say on Notre Dame or WikiLeaks or or anything that you feel like you didn't get a chance to say during the show? No, just kind of reiterating with Notre Dame, it's 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 a discomfort with impermanence, and impermanence is part of life. I mean, this is kind of a big tenet of if you want to if you want to look more into it, like you can look into Buddhism, it talks a lot about just accepting the impermanence and that things can be wonderful and beautiful and that they can also be lost in a moment. And that if you're appreciating them now and you're appreciating them for how they are, that you can also accept that loss because you don't have an expectation that's going to stay around forever. Okay. Uh, and as far as Assange, I mean, yeah, it, free speech is free speech and everybody likes their speech. But when you have, when you allow free speech, it requires you to allow dangerous speech. And that's the hard part is, how do you deal with how do you deal with dangerous genuinely like harmful ideas without just silencing people like you can't yeah. you can't always just resort to well cut their tongue out and kill them <laughs> you, know, you have to actually deal with how are you going to counter the ideas can you talk about it logically can you show why that's a bad idea right as opposed to just needing to try and squash it you know so alchemy that, so, sounded great didn't make gold so Cutting tongues out is a bad idea. Yeah, no boxes now. All right, darn. Yeah. Well, another another punishment for Paul then incoming. Um, for my thought, anything else, Sarah? No, no. Do you have do you have final thoughts yourself, Chris? I do, of course. Thank you for introducing me, Sarah. It's so nice to have a co-host who understands transitions. You got to be nicer to Terry. <laughs> no, people love it. That's people are real into Harry and I fighting. Oh, okay. Uh, we, All right. We, we have, like- we have been, we have been like two bitter old, a uh, bitter old married couple for like the last four months, and everyone's real into it. Just like people are really into dear leader demanding uh, apologies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Man, did I, <laughs> did I kick a hornet's nest with that last episode? Uh, mm-hmm. Harry, you tried to tell me, <laughs> you tried to warn me, but when do I ever listen to you? Never. Right. When you tease Never. people on air, you have to let them know first. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that either. Because I don't feel that I was mean, but I did apologize for being insensitive. And I will... mean. It doesn't matter if you're mean, but it, it does help to at least make sure the other person can play your game. Is, is in on the joke. That's you correct. You get the drama of like, oh, crap, you're not playing along, are you? Yeah, so I accidentally made Caitlin Cloven mad, and I do want to apologize to Caitlin because my intention was not to – make Caitlin Cloven mad or to insult her in any way, shape, or form. I have a great deal of respect. This for... is why I'm here. I'm here to guilt, you. guilt your leader into issuing an apology. Yes, and I appreciate it because we talked about doing this and I forgot because I was going to do it earlier in the show. So thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, my intention was not to make being libertarian and Caitlin mad. That was never my intent in any way, shape, or form. It was to promote you going to the Discord, the We Are Libertarians group, that Facebook page that has the poll, which is still never posted the next round. Like it was my intent was to be promotional by being provocative, not to insult anyone in any way, because at the end of the day, I just figured everybody would realize it was a joke because what kind of maniac wins a poll by like 10 points and then goes, I didn't win by enough. A poll, by the way, that is completely stupid and is meaningless and is just meant to be fun. What kind of maniac takes something that is meant to be a community building exercise and turns it into something that he yells at his audience about? What kind of maniac, Harry? Um, it's dear leader. One <laughs> right. One. <laughs> I just far for the course. I even we even but, just, I said explain dear leader Dennis. Well, I that you're not going to do a good enough job. Like I don't know. I felt like I was trying to be. The leader then, does not approve. No, I know. And then, and then the amount of the 300 comments on her saying that she was unhappy. Nobody listened to those to the show whatsoever. Like none of those people ever actually. Like it, it just was. It was. 
I was kind of, I like, I didn't want to make her mad and she was such a good sport and she was very kind to slide in my DMs and be an adult about it. Cause I, you know, it's, I'm not going to say I wasn't being an adult about it. I was trying to be entertaining with it. Um, but I'm sorry that not everybody got the joke and I'm, you know, I, I, I wanted to make it clear that I respect Caitlin and I did not intend to offend her or besmirch her hard work in any way, shape or form, nor the poll to be, to be honest. So it was just a way for me to be controversial, quote unquote. Like I would never be that way about anything that really was important or mattered. You know what I mean? Like when big things happen where there's fights or there's discord, I really do try to, to be an adult. But when it's about an online poll, like I can be fake petty and let my, I can let that part of myself breathe a little bit. So, so I definitely did not intend to offend her. And thank you, Sarah, for allowing me the opportunity to clean that up. Cause I did we'll intend have to find to out if it was an acceptable apology though. And she and I talked in the DMS and she seemed uh, mo- moderately annoyed with me, but accepted my apology, which is the appropriate what? reaction. Just because-, because she has accepted your private apology does not mean that you've lived up to the standards in your public apology here. We will have to see how the results on that go. It's, I'm not going to waste any more time on it. <laughs> like I, she and I talked about doing, she and I talked about doing a crossover episode and I would come on her show and publicly apologize to her there. But I did want to say that if anybody did not get the joke last week at the beginning of the Brexit episode, it was a joke. And I was just trying to promote my own and it worked because we got like, we got a ton more people in the discord this week. We got a bunch yep. of new people adding the Facebook group. Like I was trying to use this community building exercise to build community by doing it in a way that like, if I said, Hey, I really G Willikers want to win this contest. And wouldn't it be great if you added our, our group so you could help me win this contest. You're not going to do it. That's true. It's, they're not going to do that. Right. But if I act like a maniac, then, then you, you actually listen. So, um, so anyway, so whose fault is it really? It's mine. It's always oh, mine. I was going to blame them, but... Oh, yeah. It's Jared Hall's. Yeah. Jared Hall's. Yeah, we're going to have to bug him about making sure to actually post the next round. I'm wondering if he's worried that just like, I don't even want to keep going from this. I, I, I wouldn't blame them if they didn't. But who are you up against next? I'm up against Elaine Joan, who I think has something to do with the poll, so that may be why they don't want to do it, because I'm going to mop the floor with everybody, and I hope to be against Larry Sharp, Patricia Stewart in the finals, and then I'm going to wipe, wipe the floor with them, too. I'm going to team up with whoever's against you in that case. Well, honestly, my willingness to fight is waning with every passing day. I like it. You just go, I'm so busy. I don't have time to argue about fake fights and spend my morning apologizing to people over, over things that aren't really like her feelings were serious and important to me, but the poll is not that important and shouldn't be causing discord. Um, So, uh, but join discord. But Discord, please, wearelibertarians.com. And I want to thank the people who, hey, today's the 15th, so we pay a lot of wall bills on a day like today. Uh, you know, things like uh, the hosting bill gets paid today, The just a bunch of different services. And the people that make that possible are our patrons. And thanks to intern Ed, Bree Hob, Jason Doolittle, uh, Memerty Libs, the Libertarian Coalition. Uh, go join their Facebook page pages and groups and uh, Christy Avery and Craig DaCosta. Thanks to them as always for their support on We Are Libertarians and all of our patrons. We really do appreciate it. And uh, Sarah, I want to thank you for all of your hard work. You do such a good job and I look forward to seeing more content as you kind of get to work out all kinds of cool things in your new laboratory at your job. And then um, I'm sure you'll, you'll be blessing the We Are Libertarians audience with a lot of the things that you're teaching other people. And so please stay tuned to those daily episodes. And uh, thanks for being a part of it, Sarah. Well, thank you for having me on. Of course, yeah, anytime. It was fun. Except for the part where you wanted to put like steel siding in the roof of the, the Notre Dame. I mean, that was a little weird, but. No, no, no not siding. Steel beams. <laughs> yeah, steel beams, vinyl siding. Steel beams that will not melt. <laughs> Under the heat of um, what is uh, it? under the heat of jet fuel. <laughs> steel yeah. beams melt. Okay, I've got a, I've got a blank, blank. I've got a certain president I want you to meet, honey. Let's take you down to W. <laughs> <laughs> Listen here, I've got thermite. Uh, all right, everybody, thank you for listening to We Are Libertarians. We appreciate uh, your time, and if you made it this far, then you are just a very valuable member of We Are Libertarians, and we thank you. So please share with a friend. Thank you to Sarah. Thank you to Harry. And we will talk to you next time.
Hold on. 